Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. It's my pleasure to introduce you to David Rosenberg, whose lecture will specifically address a U.S. case study for Oman's water and food security. Hello, everybody. I'm David Rosenberg, the founder and CEO of Aero Farms, and here to show and present about Aero Farms, a vertical farming company, and we'll present the opportunities as it would relate to Oman as we understand it. So here, one as background, we're facing a global sustainability crisis. And just to what that means is one, and not to put people as part of the crisis, but we have population growth. And with population growth, there's a depletion of our natural resources. So as our current run rate, so food production will need to increase by 69% by 2050 to feed over 9 billion people. So the rapid increase mostly uh, in Africa and Asia is really putting a lot of uh, stresses, but in other parts of the world too, uh, putting a lot of stresses on these natural resources. And take that with the other side of the coin is the natural resources are going more detail. The world's lost a third of its farmland in the last 40 years. And that's due to soil erosion, contamination, and, and also we're over farming, depleting our the nutrients and micronutrients in ways that hurts the, 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 the soil itself. So uh, the soil degrades and also we're putting all these chemicals. So industrial farming can be really good at bringing down costs, but it's often clumsy. So water, most water goes to agriculture. Most water contamination comes from agriculture. At the same time, global demand is set to increase by 55% between 2000 and 2050. So again, you have these tensions that are really extrapolating the problem. So the US Department of Agriculture found seven pesticides, residue, uh, residual pesticides on as on average on the food that we're eating especially leafy greens so leafy green vegetables after a thorough wash there's seven pesticides on average still on the food and, and as you can see as illustrated in this photo we're using systems that are pretty clumsy often of putting applying pesticides this is what what's called a crop duster that just blankets farmland with pesticides herbicides fungicides so those are chemicals that are meant by the way to kill things like pests or weeds, not things we want to have in the human digestive system. So some people link the kind of deteriorating rates of growth of the honeybee to pesticides or increases in cancer to pesticides. And uh, here, I think there's a lot of agreement that these are often harmful chemicals we don't want in our bodies. They serve a purpose, but that purpose has the of killing pests that also has another effect. Water contamination, I referenced this earlier, so a lot of it comes from over-fertilizing. That river runoff leads to uh, getting in our rivers, algae blooms, dead zones, so a lot of water contamination, and that leads to dead fish. So back to commercial agriculture, industrial agriculture, it gets cheap product, but we're really stealing from future generations. In the same way, groundwater, we're essentially poking a straw in the ground going deeper and deeper as we deplete our groundwater and taking from future generations. Food, massive transportation miles, and, uh, and that's where we often have consolidated production, and then we, we ship out. And at, at its essence, by the way, AeroFarms were trying to democratize food production, enabling local food production at scale. But here, there's a lot of additional waste in the supply chain because we grow in one place, and then it's consumed in another. So there's approximately $1.2 trillion of food waste each year. Apologies for the background noise. I just increased the music on, of, of where I am. Solutions are enabled by rapid technology and, and the solutions are coming in, a, in, a diff, in different ways. So Aero Farms, I'll get to what we do in a moment, but we're able to grow plants with up to 390 times the productivity as a field farmer. So essentially, we grow a plant that would otherwise take 40 days in a field, and because of seasonality, have three crop turns, 
we're growing the plant in about 14 days and having about 26 crop turns. Plus we grow on multiple levels right now, about 12 levels. So that's high productivity versus a place that might have one crop turn a year or two in the U S where most of the crops are grown Salinas, then it's three water usage. So we're able to grow a plant using as much as 95% less water. And here, some of its innovative technology, some of it's just the use and the application of existing technology. For example, we filter out algae and leave in nutrients and micronutrients, and we keep water in closed loop systems so we could dehumidify or what the plants transpire and pump right into the systems. Land use, we use no farmland. So here we here we use no no farmland and we're able to grow plants not with soil plants don't need soil they need nutrients and micronutrients and we're able to grow with less nutrients and micronutrients but also no soil our growth media often is a cloth growth media in leafy greens quite often we use a synthetic material that's actually made out of recycled plastic bottles and if, from a supply chain standpoint we're able to grow locally that keeps plants fresher because, sorry, could you turn down the music? It went up. Thank you. So we're able to grow plants locally, which keeps them in the supply chain and consumed. In leafy greens, about 60% of what's grown gets wasted. So 100 pounds come off a farm, only 40 pounds get consumed. There's tremendous inefficiencies in the supply chain, just keeping the cold chain viable. In Oman, probably a lot of the products shipped in from Europe uh, Western Europe or the U.S. is my guess. Uh, from a social awareness, people, and part of this is due to COVID, people are more aware and asking questions of how what's in my food and specifically looking in, uh, for pesticides, herbicides, fungicides that they don't want in their bodies. So you do have this, this movement. Here in Oman, here, you, the way you could think about farming in a way is like a battery. So if, if where you have an energy rich country, instead of exporting that energy, there's the possibility of exporting the, the vegetables. And what I mean by that specifically is a plant takes embodied energy uh, from and light. The light could be from the sun. It could also be a spectrum of light. The problem with taking a greenhouse is a plant, let's say a plant that wants between 20 and 22 degrees Celsius, and that's their sweet spot where it really have excellent quality plants at an excellent growth rate. Here, if the if the environment is over that, and in a, in the summertime or something in a greenhouse, they get really hot. It might be significantly over that or at nighttime under it. The plant's not really growing well. So here, if in a warehouse we have multiple layer levels of growing. You could really get the specificity, specificity that the plant wants, the environmental conditions, to have excellent plant growth. So you convert the energy into light that then, or spectrum at different spectrum intensities, frequencies that then go to the plant. So in essence, the plant is becoming a battery. And that's part of the opportunity here in Oman. So here, moving to aero farms, we're very vertically oriented and it's not about growing a plant it's about growing an excellent quality plant that otherwise couldn't be grown locally so we it starts with the plant biology for us it's for us it's what's the best a plant could be taste texture nutritional value color shelf life etc cetera, etc cetera. and then what does the plant want to be the best what's the temperature humidity co2 levels airflow uh, nutrients, micronutrients, again, not light, but spectrum intensity, frequency. What are all these environmental pieces? It could be proximity of seed to the neighboring seed, but how do we take that, understand what it is, and then deliver it? And we deliver it mechanically. It could be operationally. It could be environmentally. It could be biologically. It could be genetically. So how do you control maybe the genetics that wants a different uh, a different amount of temperature humidity? The data science really pulls it together so, and just like we have to illustrate the complexity at Aero Farms, mechanical engineer, structural lighting, electrical, PLC process, industrial design, working with plant biologists, physiologists, pathologists, molecular biologists, microbiologists, working with 
data scientists and software programmers that tie it together with lean manufacturing people, with construction people, but how does this all come together in an integrated approach? The innovation is pretty vast. And here uh, I'll share another way of quantifying it. Where I have about 300 and last, but last count, about 315 invention disclosures, over 50 patents and pending patents, over 50 trade secrets. And uh, we're, and, it, and it's growing. Uh, we, we're, it's growing pretty rapidly and we innovate with other partners to accelerate our innovation cycles. Just calling out a few. Uh, overall, our growth systems, we're on model, we're building model five. That's our fifth generation of technology. We, uh, we have built the prototypes. We're building bigger pilot farms of model six. And I say pilot because it's not about building big, small. Big is has better costs. There are, are economies of scale in actually automation of processing. For us, that's automation and seeding, harvesting, cleaning, packaging. Once you put in that automation, which you do either for quality or labor reductions, you want to utilize it. You don't want it running an hour a day. So you want a lot of growing to utilize the processing. And we um, are innovating not just on, on the whole system, but it's like every like so many different parts, like our HVAC system, it's on our fifth generation of design. Our lighting is about our fifth generation of design. Our machine vision system is our third generation of design. Our aeroponic system, which is how we deliver nutrients to the micronutrients, our fourth generation. Our growth media, which is the soil replacement, our fourth generation. Our automatic nutrient delivery system. And here, I'll, I'll share the specificity. It's not about just putting in a soup of fertilizers, but we break that out to 18 different minerals and elements in eight different groupings that can re can get re-entered into our pool of nutrient solution every 15 minutes. So there are sensors, a sensory loop that understands zinc, magnesium, iron, et cetera, et cetera, what the plants are absorbing and replenish it all to optimize plant growth. And our automation systems are control. So we're on multiple generations of technology and it's moving very fast. And our costs are continually going down as our ability to grow new and new varieties of plants. So we're uh, putting in, these are examples of different levels of automation and how we have automation between the automation. We're starting to get into robotics. That's an example where we're not putting it, we're not innovating in robotics, but partnering with others. Like soft touch robotics is in re really behind us. The 90% the here means it's not full automation. In my experience in manufacturing, and this is, I, I've been like CEOs of uh, different organizations for the last 20 years, but in the a highly innovative disruptive technology piece for the last 30 years world for the last 30 years and it's not about pushing the, an organization for full automation you could spend 90 percent of your resources for the last 10 percent so here we're about 90 percent automated uh, and so there is some manual elements there but this is kind of cool so we um we innovated in imaging. We realized at AeroFarms, like imaging, it's like there's what lenses, like there's multispectral imaging, there's uh, in, d different types of images, di different types of lenses, and how do they get used and applied? Like right now, we could use a camera to like see inside a plant to understand from a photosynthesis standpoint, is a chlorophyll filled or not filled? If it's filled, then you don't want to put on more light because it's essentially like wasted light, you're not adding to photosynthesis. So it's what's the right intensity and frequency of the light and what's the right spectrum. You could strip off some of the spectrum that really isn't relevant for photosynthesis and amplify other spectrum. But then you could also use imaging to understand width, height, stem length, petiole length, curvature, spotting, ripping, discoloration. It's all very inf good information. And how do we use it to inform the farmer, essentially the operator? have effective operations. Uh, this is These are some examples of some of the images. So here you can see like a farmer comes in the morning, they look at their smart device and it says, oh, the plants are growing well, or there's a problem, a red box. And we gotta quickly look at that red area and see what's going on and why the plant's not growing well. How do we learn from it? Can we course correct to get the plants going well? And it's biology, just like your kids, two kids, the same parents, same environment, that you'd think they're 
the same. They're different. They're very different. It's biology. It's not like making a widget. The plants are different. And how do we make adjustments as such? But here, what we're trying to communicate is there's so many levers that influence plant growth. I would argue that our biggest at Aero Farms contribution to the ag space is unlocking this mystery of plant growth. You ask a farmer, hey, the crop was good this season, was bad last season, and you ask why. And often they'll give you guesses. It was really hot, it was really cold, it was really wet, it was really dry, but they don't really know. And here, like we call our 26 crop turns a year, 26 learnings a year. How do we use the data science, the data analytics to really unlock this mystery of plant biology and understand what's going on? Here are some of the levers, air speed, light spectrum, intensity, temperature, relative humidity, CO2, water. And, and it's uh, all these things, it's not just adding them, it's the absence of them. So it's the right levels and they have influence on all the qualities of the plant, like taste, texture, and so forth. Here, the point I want to make is there's an element of a networking effect. Networking effect meaning like an Uber or an Airbnb or a Facebook where you want to be on the platform. So we are we spend a lot of resources building the automation controls. So that for us, that's the MES, the user interface, the PLC program logic controls, the SCADA, and our controls engineers and programmers that pull it all together that seamlessly integrate to sensors, valves, pumps, lights, airflow systems, CO2 systems. So we understand what the plants and at a touch of a keystroke, whether that farms in Oman or Abu Dhabi or New Jersey or Virginia or anywhere on the equator or the North Pole, anywhere in the world, we could digitally influence what the plants get and take information separated into its use cases, what's going to sales, marketing, finance, operations, quality assurance, R&D, to understand how we learn and be better. So there's this iterative process that's extremely important in our systems. Here, from a technology standpoint, the, the cost structure is going down and it's both first powered by LEDs, light emitting diodes, but the point we're trying to make is our costs are going down faster than the cost of a diode because we're innovating alongside. Like I mentioned, we're giving the plant not just light, but specific spectrum of light. We're finding out through AI, through other features, how to grow plants better, essentially how to do more with less. To quantify this one way, we used to grow a plant, take a seed, grow it in 26 to 20 or 25 days. And when I started the company in 2011, today we grow that same plant in 14 days to the same maturity. From So from about 25 days to 14 days, so that enables us about 26 crop turns a year. That's more output per capital expense, more revenue per capital expense, better IRRs. And in our next design prototyping, we're growing that same plant in about 11 days. So I think there's limitations to biology. We're not going to all of a sudden grow a plant in a day, but we're going to continue to grow plants faster that, that lead to a better cost position. Here, a point we're making is it's we're not just a technology company, we're an operating company. The SOPs, the standard operating processes are too complex. So it's it's not just here's the equipment, good luck to you, but how they run the equipment, what's the seeds, the right genetics, the right nutrients and micronutrients, et cetera, is vitally important. So we used to sell farm equipment, big farm equipment. We actually stopped doing that because we realized we have to be operators. It's way too complex. And that's why we've spent a lot of money in the controls. So when we send someone to a farm in Oman or wherever, they're not only ensuring it's right, not only ensuring the preventative maintenance. When there are problems with a farm, you really start to see it after a year. So you know what's going well, what isn't. But they're also working on the plant biology side to make sure it's not about growing a plant. It's about growing a great plant consistently. And we also realize we have to advance technology because it's there are a lot of problems that just aren't solved yet. So I mentioned the imaging system. I mentioned the fertigation system, the nutrient delivery lighting system. So we're, we're technology innovators as well. So here we do have a branded product. We sell commercially. We also have a technology platform, the data science here, Dell is shown here in partnerships. So we have a lot of partnerships to accelerate our, our innovation cycles. Uh, we've won about 50 awards 
uh, you know, since 2011. And this is like Time Magazine, best invention in 2019, fast companies, most innovative company. In the Food Tech 500, which is a list of 500 companies in food tech, we were ranked number one. And um, the SDGs award, I'll just call this out, we were the, the pioneering winner and uh, they had a, a winner in each category and a category of zero hunger, we won that. But there's a lot of, I'm um, here in Dubai, we're winning, we just, later today, I'm gonna be receiving the Global Prosperity Award at the GMS Global Manufacturing Conference, which is uh, in Dubai this year. So we've been innovating. I mentioned how we're increasing our our designs. We're actually building a $100 million R&D facility in Abu Dhabi just to continue accelerating the innovation cycles. Uh, we we sell in the U.S. Here's a, our branded product. These are the customers that we sell at and Walmart. So, and these, we're expanding with these customers. So we're, uh, we just found out we're recently we'll be expanding to several more hundred Walmarts. Uh, we just went into like Stop and Shop, 350 uh, Stop yeah. and Shops just several weeks ago. And, and um, Amazon owns, owns Whole Foods. We're expanding with these. So we're expanding in products like this that you see under, again, a branded product. And, and if you look at Walmart and Whole Foods, those are, you see, have a mass market retailer and a specialty retailer. We're also selling to food service, so like Google's cafeterias in on the East Coast, um, Amazon's cafeterias, American Express, Citibank. So we're in food service. We're in mass market retailers, specialty retailers, and online retailers. Uh, on the partnerships of here, this is an image of the R&D facility in Abu Dhabi we're building. We also use our platform on genetics. So this is PIP stands for precision indoor plants. So a lot of different companies here, you see PASF, but a lot of different companies are innovating on our platform to improve the genetics of a plant. That's half the equation. And we're also uh, developing, so CRISPR-Cas9, the Nobel Prize in chemistry in 2020 went to the developers of CRISPR-Cas9. The first in the world CRISPR-Cas9 product was developed on our platform. Uh, we're also getting into more uh, varieties of plants. So hortifruit, which is the 800-pound gorilla in blueberries globally, uh, we're innovating with them on blueberries to build vertical farms for blueberries. Strawberries, we're innovating with other partners that are confidential, but we've been growing berries for for years. And now we have consistent, excellent quality berries at a uh, excellent yield. Now we're working on the, the big commercialization of this. Uh, Cargill and other one of the largest ag companies, they're working to innovate on cacao. So here, this is a, a tree, and we're innovating on their genetics for cocoa so they can have better impact. And it's not just about what's in vertical farms, but even to help field farmers. We're on a NIH, and here, this is talking about our platform and the uh, utilization of our platform. We're working with the National Institute of Health to grow plants for the pharmaceutical industry. And here, this is a, a cool example of also the high utility of our platform. And, and people come to us continually to help solve problems in their agriculture supply chain. So AB InBev, also known as Anheuser-Busch, the largest CPG consumer packaged good company in the world, they came to us because there's a trend of specialty beers that are made out of specialty hops and how we could, without going into details, how we could grow some specific hops that are having trouble with in the field. So within 18 months, we figured out how to grow a hop and for them to use it to go in their beers. So here you can see on the lower right that it's actually branded in their beers for this one brand. So with that, we're continually looking to partner with others and spread. We'd love to be in Oman. I'm actually gonna be there tomorrow uh, to see how we could, let me stop sharing, but to see how we could hopefully uh, partner and expand our, our reach presence in Oman. So with that, happy to open it up to any Q&A and take the conversation where appropriate. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Richard. Fascinating. I have to say there's, there's a lot to take in, a lot of information. Um, and uh, in terms of technology and innovation, you're obviously extremely advanced. Um, so tell me, looking at your PowerPoint, and it's on your website as well, one thing that I, um, I found uh, interesting is that you say you have solutions to most of the world's main agricultural challenges, of course, you know, population growth, water scarcity, arable land loss, overuse of pesticides, and so on. But there must be challenges going into a region like the Gulf of the Middle East. You're now in Dubai, you're going to Oman tomorrow, you're here obviously for a, a specific reason, um, uh, which is very different to what you see in the US. What do you see as the greatest barriers of your business model uh, in Oman and the wider region, and, and, and are there? 
So uh, the greatest is there's certain crops that, let's say, people have been used to eating. And often what I've seen in the region is the quality of the salads is pretty poor. And it's not surprising. It's often being shipped from like long distances, Europe and the U.S. And the varieties are very small. So people are used to certain varieties and certain poor quality. Salads are the most nutritionally dense food group. There's more nutrition per calorie from salads than any other food group. Number one is watercress. It's called a superfood. Number two is kale. And in the U.S. and other markets, there's um, like a lot of people are eating more and more salads. In COVID, as a category, packaged salads have increased in the U.S. about 25% So uh, during COVID. At, at Aero Farms, at our retailers, uh, they certain ones have shared that our sales have increased 75%, so three times what the category is. And that's because we have a distinctive product. So there's an element of like learning to grow plants that the region's used to, but also how do we show the region that there are just better quality salads? So here, I, I said twice in this presentation, it's not about growing a plant, it's about growing a great, great quality plant. So can we change the, the, the society to embrace, to celebrate other varieties and how fast can we do that? And then start changing your eating habits to, to, uh, to eat different food. And the also, and with that, if you look at consumption per pound per capita or per unit of weight per capita, the region has lower consumption rates than in parts of Western Europe and the US. And again, this is the healthiest food area in, in parts of the region, there are high levels of diabetes. So how do we get people to s stop eating like the fries and start eating healthier foods? As an entrepreneur, as an innovator, one of the the risks you 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 don't want to embrace too much is human behavioral change. It's just it takes time. It's less certain. So technology change and adoption, you kind of or you could or risk you could bracket that. There are certain risks you could bracket. Human behavioral change it's harder to bracket. And this is an example of how do we work with whether it's the educational system or something. It usually starts with the kids, but how do we change that that element? And that's a greater challenge in this region than it is, for example, in the US. There are other benefits of the region, and maybe it makes sense for me to touch on those because it's uh, no, no, you don't want to just talk about the challenges. So the benefits okay. are, for, from what I see, there's this like, um, one, there's a lot of capital. So there are regions, countries that are mine are, are relatively wealthy compared to others. And where there's wealthy, where there's more capital as an entrepreneur, you want to go to places where, okay, they're willing to take pioneering steps. So um, I see that in, in the UAE. I think I'm, I'm seeing it in Oman as well, where people are willing to kind of be early adopters and kind of use their capital to sort of lead in a, in a way that really sparks innovation and, and really brings up society. So uh, I gave an example in the panel of solar. So the early adopters of solar were Germany and the US. And then now you have the cost comes down, you have it's moved to mainstream, and now you have beneficial solutions for sub-Saharan Africa, where people now have distributed energy. But we as entrepreneurs, as innovators, we want to go to places where they're willing to uh, to make to be bolder. And it aligns with the lack of resources. So there's not a lot of farmland. There's not as much fresh water. So there's high pain, but there's also relatively cheap energy. So from a business plan standpoint, there's strong alignment. And now if, with like a little sprinkle of boldness, you could have a solution that really works. And it really, uh, this is why we at AeroFarms decided like the MENA region is a good focus point for us. So we're building out in the US, but after the US, we're, our, our main focus is this region. Sure, no, absolutely. I encourage, of course, uh, everyone who's joining um, us to also ask questions via the chat. Um, and, and while that's happening, um, I do have another question for you. In terms of 
uh, you obviously, as a, as a company, you are um, you're a disruptor in many ways. Obviously, you're, you're challenging the whole the, the whole farming process that we've done for for, for centuries. Um, but what are the company's ambitions beyond the immediate future? Uh, so your mission statement clearly outlines that you're you're uh, out to grow the best plants possible for the betterment of humanity. Now, that's a very bold phrase, and 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 long may it be. Um, you know, what are those greater ambitions? There's so much already packed in what you've told us this morning with your presentation. Yeah, so it's, first, I, I would say our biggest contribution to the ag space, as I referenced earlier, is to unlock this Rosetta Stone, if you will, of what makes a plant grow. I, I would argue, uh, my last company was Nanotech. At, well, I led a, founded and built a Nanotech for 10 years. Then I was in before that, in internet infrastructure before that in fintech so it, like i have a long history of disruptive technology and success of disruptive technology but in ag tech or agriculture i am shocked how ignorant people are on what makes a plant grow and it's because you can't have scientific experimentation effectively in ag and you think about the process of scientific experimentation one needs to isolate a variable test an assumption when you can't isolate a variable, which you can't in the field because there are too many, I'm looking outside, there are too many uncontrolled variables. The weather does what it does. It's like, it's hot, it's cold, it's wet, it's dry, et cetera, et cetera. And, and then you have other things with like animals coming in. So it's very hard to really understand cause and effect. With fully controlled agriculture, we have cause and effect. And furthermore, the way I lead, we have a brilliant team, brilliant operators, brilliant innovators, very strong leadership team. But like as CEO, I often start off with like, what are our philosophies? So like one of it is every time we grow a plant, we have to learn. Even if like when people buy, they're actually buying a scientific experiment. It's very small. Like what happens if you put a little more magnesium, a little more zinc, a little more iron, change the seed spacing a little bit, change the spectrum a little bit, change the temperature a little, change the humidity, CO2, whatever it is, cause and effect learn. So there are small changes. The plants, like the people that are eating it, don't aren't even realizing they're eating an experiment. But there it's a, as much a data science play as anything else. So we're getting this data. We're learning biology. We're learning how to make changes. So number one is take an understanding of plant science to whole nother levels where we could influence taste, texture, nutritional density. Like we, uh, I was talking and understanding high rates of diabetes here. Part of the reason why people have high diabetes is there's nutrient deficiencies, vitamin deficiencies in eating habits. So if we could influence, so we have testing where we influenced vitamin A, vitamin C levels, and tizinin levels. So here by like three X over a control, it's just by stressing plants different ways, just like it's we as human beings. If, if I eat, sleep, exercise differently, my genetics are the same, but my biochemistry is different. In the same way, we could, as funny as it sounds, get a plant to eat, sleep, exercise differently and change their phytochemistry or their nutrient density. So then you have higher performing or almost functional foods. So I think there's a, a lot of contribution in understanding that. So what I just said to answer your question, understand plant science to whole nother levels, but it, it can't stop there. It's like, what do you do with that knowledge? Ultimately, it's to understand how to use that to influence plants, to be better. So how do we make plants better? And it can't stop there. Ultimately, it's to be better farmers. So how do we do that at commercial scale so people can enjoy better product? And, and with that platform, we're building it as a platform, we could have broader and broader impact to our farms and more fruits and vegetables. So we've grown about 550 different varieties of plants. And what that tells you is our, we have very big ambitions. Transparently, we only really know how to make money off 30 of those. So it's really hard. So our beachhead, let's make money off the 30. So the leafy greens that we know how to grow and commercialize, we have high success. And then how do we scale that to berries, strawberries, blueberries, et cetera, et cetera. And, and use the platform, whether it's on our farms or other farms, where I think there's high utility of the platform to have broader and broader impact, again, growing plants for the betterment of humanity, that is broad because it adds a, allows us to have broad impact, again, whether it's our farms, others. But it starts from that process, understanding plant biology, what to do with it, impacting the plants, and then how do we commercialize. Right. Thank you. Um, I do have a question on the chat. Um, someone has said the whole uh, culture of food consumption is going local, so consume what is close to you geographically. Uh, our country is uh, sustainable that 
our country sustainable that anchor their food security around 70% imports. So I guess the, the, I'm not the sure idea that sounds like a statement more than a question, but I'll, but I'll yeah. respond to it. The, um, so that speaks to the opportunity in the region. So if, and one thing that COVID showed is globally, we have a centralized food production system. And when there's a problem with that centralized food production system, the impacts are, are felt worldwide and it leads to empty shelves and in, and there's more awareness. So in a, in a region, in a country like Oman, where you're importing 70% of your food, there's greater risk from a food security standpoint. So one of the ways to de-risk that is to produce locally. So at its essence, what Aero Farms is doing is enabling local food production at scale. So creating that, that geopolitical security, that food security that, that leads to other securities. And that's one of the reasons we're coming into the area. You decided this is a focal point because it aligns so much better in our, in our value proposition. And this gets to my earlier point of where an entrepreneur goes is like that I referenced um, this book, Jeffrey Moore, who wrote Crossing the Chasm. Is um, like it's one of the Bibles of Silicon Valley of how you go from early adopters to mainstream, but you got to nail the early adopters. So for us at Aero Farms, our early adopters were growing in our backyard in the United States, but is the Mena region because it aligns with our value proposition, and we have a greater value proposition. So we're going to build that in the region, hopefully Oman soon. As mentioned, I'll I'll be there tomorrow. Yep, absolutely. All right, we're almost um, at the close of the session, but I have one more question I'd like to pose to you from the chat. Someone says, vertical farming is not cheap. And from experience, I've found that imported vegetables are cheaper. I'm not sure how we can make vertical more competitive. What is your experience? Well, here I referenced like to that we're in Walmart and we're in Whole Foods. So I, I didn't build a company to have product for a few rich people. I did it to change the world. So it's very important that we're competitive at Walmart and we're going from transparently like I guess I can't share the number, but we're adding several hundred more Walmarts. We're also just went into like a competitive Walmart called Stop and Shop, which is in the, in the U.S. It's about kind of that demographic of customer. We just added 350 Stop and Shops. So what that tells you is we know how to make money, not just at the Whole Foods, but at other more price sensitive demographics of the 30 varieties. So we're not doing it on all varieties. You have to pick your beachhead. And we do transparently, we sell in the category of organics. So in the US, organics sell at a 20% premium over non-organics. And transparently, we need that 20% premium to make the margins we want to make. But um, that's 20% is not uh, uh, over, it's not too big that we're, we're pulling in people that, that want quality food. Uh, so the short is, I think the economics work in places like Oman, uh, people have to appreciate there's a premium for better quality food, but I think the consumers, when they're educated, will will take that and it, it'll, it'll taste better and it'll be healthier for them, Not no pesticides. But there's an element, back to my earlier point of behavioral change, you get people to understand that and, and, and it is a, a better product. And then I think the cost structure is going to be lower because energy is a lot cheaper than I think we're, we're seeing where we're building in the U.S. So I'm, I'm bullish of the business plan and, and the viability. 